What's up, my fellow primates, fellow pieces of shit? I know it's been a while since I've uploaded anything, but I was doing this thing where I dissociate for two years, but now I'm back to tell you about Spoolie Boys. <laughs> so, like, back in 1905, this Swiss guy, Alfred Bucci, was like, hey, you know what would be cool? What if we used exhaust gases to spit a turbine, forcing more air into the combustion chamber of an engine? <laughs> yes, I know everyone is starving. Who isn't? Although Alfred had patented this idea, nobody um, gave a shit until later on when people found out that planes don't really do plane stuff the higher up you go. And that became a problem when the United States was standing on some business over in Europe. You know what they say in America, we may not be the first, but we sure as hell will perfect it and use it to kill Nazis. Now that the history lesson is over with, we can get into more modern applications. The first turbocharged car was made by GM in 1962, called the Oldsmobile Cutlass Jetfire. Now notice how I didn't say successful. The package that included the turbocharger was a $3,000 bump in today's money, and I wouldn't exactly call it a Toyota of its time. In fact, it was so unreliable they pulled the plug on it a year later. But hey, we all gotta start somewhere. Feast your eyes on the pinnacle of automotive engineering. Under the hood, we have a turbo rocket V8 engine producing 215 freedom horses. To cool everything down, this baby's equipped with a water methanol fluid injection system, making sure peak performance is delivered on every ride. My friends, this isn't just a car, it's a rocket on wheels. <laughs> The true boom for turbocharged cars didn't happen until we started having a little bit of an oil crisis in the 70s and 80s. You see, the main application for turbochargers was not only to produce more power, but also to have improved fuel economy. And turbulence in the Middle East, shocker, made oil a lot harder to get in the 70s. The solution for this was to make big engines small and push a lot of air into it. This works because small turbocharged engines don't have the same friction and weight of a big 6 liter V8 while still having the same displacement of air and thus, more fuel economy. You understand, Jimmy? Little shit. But I doubt any of you came here to learn about fuel efficiency. No, 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 no. Let's get into performance. In the 80s, car manufacturers such as Nissan and Porsche started offering turbocharged models to their lineup, making cars such as the 911 Turbo and the 300ZX cultural icons. But with great power comes a greater, steamy pile of unreliable turbo turds. I'll put up a list so I don't have to pronounce every one of these names. You can see why the rest of the world doesn't exactly love American-made cars. The 90s saw the surge of JDM performance with cars that weighed less than a knockoff iPhone but had massive potential. Cars like the Skyline GTR and the Lancer Evo were outperforming V8 muscle cars, which used to be the only way to get a lot of power out of an engine. But it doesn't stop there. Because of Jip, because of Jip, because of Japan's Gentleman's Agreement in 1988 stating that cars should produce no more than 276 horsepower, JDM cars were underpowered from the factory but built like tanks. Which means any tuner worth their salt could easily squeeze out an extra 200 horsepower out of these platforms. Cars like the Toyota Supra are even known to handle upwards of 800 horsepower on stock internals. Take that, Carol Shelby. The modern tuner scene in America didn't really take off until the late 90s and early 2000s when aftermarket turbo kits along with plug and play tuning software were blowing up in popularity. A great example is the Dodge Neon SRT4. Now if build quality wasn't a concern for you, you could find yourself in one of these for a quarter less than the cost of a new WRX. Not bad Dodge. This meant with a McDonald's salary you could smoke your dad's Camaro on the way to buy yourself a new water pump. Yeah. And because the SRT4 came factory with the turbo, adding more power was as simple as driving down to your nearest tuning shop and pushing more boost than the Dodge Neon ever needed to see. Unfortunately, because of how affordable these cars were and the age group they attracted, most of these cars today are either totaled or modified beyond recognition. The few left alive or garage kept likely to never see the light of day again. While adding a turbocharger to a top trim level sports car like the Type R Civic is still a popular performance option today. The majority of turbochargers are added to econo boxes with pathetically small engines. Seriously, look at the Chevy tracks. And unfortunately, unless we come up with an alternative combustible fuel source, the age of throwing a turbo on your mom's 2007 Accord and waking up your neighbors at 2am will soon be a thing of the past. Well that's it. See ya.